I wanted to introduce and I um, talk about this today because it's an important concept that we do need to talk about, and it's uh, sometimes useful in problem solving. Not in all the problems, but it's uh, this idea of center of mass. And uh, let me illustrate it this way with uh, this uh, simulation here. Um, so this simul I don't know if you can read it. There's a little thing that's a, uh, can I? Well, that's the biggest I can make it. Uh, there's a little thing called the center of mass here. Uh, it uh, puts a dot at the sort of center between the two, um, two objects. And so one way you can describe center of mass is that, well, it, it's an average position. But, um, but it doesn't average in a particular way. Let me add one more ball so that I can do. Uh -huh. uh, I think a three is more interesting than just one. So let me do the three. All right, so I have three balls, and you see how that dot is sort of in the midpoint between them, right? Good. So that's a basic idea about center of mass. But um, here's one more thing that comes into consideration when they calculate center of mass. Let me make it so that this, uh, well, let's put it this way. So both the ball and two and three are here. Um, does this look like this is at the center between one, two, and three? Maybe, if you are imagining there being a triangle, then maybe that is in some sense a center. Now let me try this. I'm going to make, take the ball one and make it much more massive. So ball one, is twice as massive as these two balls combined. So center of mass somehow gets closer to ball one. The, so OK, does this make intuitive sense? That this somehow represents an average of the position. Now, if we were taking these three dots and averaging their positions, you wouldn't pick this, right? But something about this picture made this reasonable. What was that? Yeah, there's more mass in ball one. Or here's another way to think about it. So, you know, in, in a sort of very elementary kind of way, we could say instead of there being only one ball here, maybe there's actually, I can only have five balls total. <laughs> all right, all right, let me do it this way. <laughs> So let me have it three times as much mass. OK, so this is where center of mass is right now. Let me uh, mark this position here. So instead of there being one ball at the position of ball one, you could almost think of it as, all right, uh, what if there were three balls at the position of ball one, all with the same mass? So if they all had the equal importance, uh, yeah, if I have three balls here, then yes, center of mass does fall there. So, um, so in that sense, center of mass is a sort of average position of the masses that you have. If uh, all the equal masses were equally important. So let me introduce the idea of center of mass that way. So that's how you want to express center of mass. So, um, so when we talk about center of mass, um, the, important, the most important one word here is center. It describes a kind of position. So the idea of center of mass, it's describing some kind of position, x center of mass. And this x center of mass, I could call it, roughly speaking, some kind of average position. So let's say you had three masses. How do you average position of three masses? How do you take any kind of average? Divided by, OK, all right. So uh, let me keep in my head that this is a vector quantity. I mean, this won't really complicate things all that much. But all right, you said add three positions and divide, divide by three? 
OK? So if you are just trying to express the idea of average, this is how we would take the average. Um, x1, position of one, plus position of the other, plus position of something else, divided by three. And if we are dealing with the two dimensions, or three, we we'll, should make sure that it's a vector quantity. Um, you know, this is a reminder to ourselves that we would do it for x direction separately from the y direction and z direction separately from those. Okay? Now, when you look at this expression, um, here's a bit of a problem I have. With this simulation here, this is what you saw, and you know, which agreed with your intuition, is that if one of the masses was heavier than, more massive than the other, if it had three times as much as as much mass as the other masses, then the center of mass would be closer to it, right? When you look at this formula, I have no room for that. Like, mass wasn't even <laughs> in the expression that you gave me, right? So I need to be able to express that if a ball one is more massive, that it has to be more important than the other two positions. Yeah, there's a coefficient. How many here have taken a kind of statistics class? Um, have you covered something called a weighted mean or weighted average? Um, <laughs> I see. So let me uh, let me introduce it this way because this is the way in which it will make sense to you uh, sense over the long term. I could just simply give you the formula, but this is what this formula means. So this is an average position. But it's a very particular kind of average position. It's an average position, weighted. Um, it, this is a statistical word, by the way. Weight means importance of a particular data point. So uh, when a data point has a greater weight, then it has a greater importance. It has nothing to do with the physical weight, uh, which is a force. Sorry, it's going to be confusing. <laughs> so it's weighted by uh, masses at each position. So you express this weight with the idea of um, importance of, uh, with the coefficients. So what the coefficient here would be is maybe you are intuitively guessing this already. What the coefficient here would be is the masses. So it'll be m1 plus m2 plus m3 times position. Now, if I simply leave it here, um, uh, I'm in a little bit of trouble because this is not in unit of mass. I'm sorry, not unit of position, right? It's a mass times position, but I want average position. So how am I going to get my units back to where it should be? Three times, uh, which coefficient? Uh, the sum of them. Ah, sum. OK. Now, that's a, a good intuition as far as uh, units go. But when you do this, you'll realize that your answer is off. Small by, smaller by factor of three for some reason. Let me re-express this so that I'm properly introducing the idea of weighted mean. Where's my eraser? Oh. <laughs> so, so let me actually go back to my original expression. And so what this original average means, this is also a weighted average. The only difference here was that each of these points had equal weight. I can express that. So the weighted average, where each point have equal weight, would be, well, 1 times position plus 1 times the position plus 1 times position. Okay? And with this weight in mind, I want to re-express the bottom. Instead of saying it's 3, I want to say it's the sum of all these weights. Yeah, one plus one plus one. And you can see how this way of defining average will easily expand to however many numbers you have. Yep. 
And let me do it, let me do the average now as a weighted by the mass at each position. Then what we are doing is these ones I'm replacing by weight. So instead of having one here, it's going to be M1. So instead of this one, uh, which used to be the old weight, I'm going to make that M1 times that. And instead of this one, which was the old weight, it'll be M1. Right now it looks weird, but you know, once I go through the whole thing, it'll be fine. Um, then the next weight, instead of saying it's a, you know, weight has weight of one, we want to make sure their relative importance is correctly captured. So it'll be M2 times X2. And uh, this weight will also be replaced again with M2. And the same thing with any other new points that come up. And with any new point, we are going to say, well, each new point is, its importance is given by however much mass there is. How, however much mass is at that particular position. So this will be plus M3. So this is the formula for a center of mass when you have one, two, three masses. And written out this way, I hope uh, you can see how you might generalize this to any n number of uh, masses that you might be calculating average. Uh, uh, for, for, let me write it down here. So x center of mass is equal to, well, I see what I'm adding here. So I'm going to write this as a summation of mi times the position of that mass, where i goes from 1 to however many particles I have divided by sum of mi, where i goes from 1 to however many particles you have. Okay? And if you ever take a statistics again, or for the first time, you will see this formula again. And this is what they call weighted mean. So the quantity that you see here, this is what, you do, what they would call weighted mean or average. And the weights are these. So that's the center of mass. It's a, uh, so I wanted to start out with the correct intuition. Is, and the correct intuition is that it's the, um, it's the average position. It's just that as you take the average, you take care to make sure that more massive objects, position of the more massive objects are more important. Yeah. It's like, you know. In a household, like, you know, imagine a nuclear family of two parents and two children. Um, are children's opinion as important as the parents' opinion? Not really, right? <laughs> um, so, anyways, but you know, um, so, so with the masses, it's less controversial. Um, now, th there's a reason this idea of center of mass is important. Let me uh, demonstrate it with this uh, um, simulation again. Uh, let's see. I want to go back to the simplest picture possible. Let me just make their masses the same. Doesn't really matter right now, but I'll, I'll just make them the same so that it looks uh, simple. So right now, if I run the simulation, Nothing interesting happens really because they are not really moving, right? Uh, let me do one more boring kind of simulation. If I have masses one and two, and if they are both moving to right with a kind of similar velocity, then once again, nothing interesting will happen. So sort of, all right, I expected that to happen. Good. Or even if one was moving slower than the other, you would say, ah, that's boring. Nothing interesting is happening. Yeah? Something interesting begins to happen when I make them collide with each other. So actually, let me start out with this. So I could say, all right, one and two, now they're going to move in opposite direction. Can I have them move about the same velocity? Now it's maybe beginning to look a little more interesting. As they are moving, center of mass is not moving. But that makes all intuitive sense, right? Now, what if I was to arrange them so that as they are moving in opposite directions, now they will collide with each other? Let's see what happens. 
Hmm. All right, so something happened uh, at the very end. But up until this point, nothing really happened to the center of mass. Watch. So even through the collisions, the center of mass doesn't move. And uh, it would be the same thing if it was something like this, where one of the balls simply isn't moving. Then through the collision, watch, look at the motion of the center of mass. Does the motion of center of mass look like it, like anything happened to the center of mass through the collision? No, like center of mass just continues moving the way it was, right? So it's a pr special property of center of mass. So when you look at the simulation, you see that this center of mass, it only gets, motion of the center of mass only is affected. Not when these two things are colliding with each other, but when they collide with the walls, that's when the motion of center of mass changes. And, um, and that's closely related to conservation of momentum. In fact, you can look at it here this way. Um, so take this whole expression here, expression for the center of uh, mass. Imagine that you took this whole expression and took time derivative of it. What would you get on the left-hand side? Yeah. So you would get velocity of center of mass is equal to and the right hand side is a little bit more complicated. You, you know, masses are constant. So this derivative comes in, hits this, gives you the velocity, gets distributed, hits this, gives you velocity also. Distributed, hits this, gives you velocity also. So you get um, m1 v1 plus m2 v2 plus m3 v3 plus divided by m1 plus m2 plus m3. And right now, I'm really only interested in um, how does this uh, velocity of center of mass changes. As you look at this, can you point to something here and say that under particular conditions that this change of velocity of center of mass will be zero? Like, does anything on the right-hand side look familiar? Does this look like something you have different name for, other than mass times velocity? Yeah, this is momentum. So this is momentum of particle one plus momentum of particle two plus momentum of particle three. Being divided by this for some reason, but I don't care about the denominator. What, do you, what can you tell me about some of these three momenta? What can you tell me about it, if anything? So if I have only a system of three particles, then this would be the total momentum, right? When is the total momentum conserved? So that I can say change of this, is zero. So, you know, looking at this, momentum is, total momentum is conserved when that impulse due to external force is equal to zero. In other words, going back to this interaction you saw here, when they were interacting with each other, the only thing that's involved there is internal force. So with these internal forces, momentum doesn't change. The total momentum doesn't change. The change, oh, uh, I mixed up colors. So change of these three momenta, the change here is equal to zero. Meaning change of the velocity of center of mass is also equal to zero. For these internal interactions, it's only when these balls undergo interaction with the outside object when there's external force, then now the velocity of center of mass begins to change. But, you know, so if you watch this carefully, it's only when the collision with the wall happens that the velocity of center of mass changes. But throughout anything else, even when these two balls collide with each other, maybe they will, 
they're not going to, never mind. Don't want to wait too long. Um, so, yeah, that's fine. So, um, so yeah, that's a special property of center of mass. If I want to summarize it, this is how I can summarize it. The motion of center of mass, uh, let me summarize it here. I can summarize it this way. Motion of center of mass, um, center of mass is affected by, oh, sorry, is affected only by external forces. That means if there's some complicated interaction that involves, you know, interaction between some, you know, objects. So, you know, if these two balls are coming in and hitting this tennis ball, then I can say without analyzing anything that the center of mass of these three particles, even through whatever complicated interaction, will not be affected. It's a kind of a useful, um, for certain types of problems, I thought that's what worksheet uh, eight problem 13 was. Um, but maybe that's not so interesting. Um, hmm. um, let me, I think this is probably the best uh, illustration I can give. Let me, um, so um, this is kind of like what problem 13 is, but we won't go through it explicitly. So let me arrange these two cards so that they are set to repel each other. Do it on track. So I put them close, they're actually going to repel each other, right? And you have a good sense how um, these two uh, cards will end up moving if they have the same mass. It's all symmetric, so they will equally repel each other, move at the same speed, right? Now, suppose I ask you this question instead. Um, one of the cart is heavier. It's a three times as heavy as the other cart. And I tell you, all right, they both start out at, uh, I don't know, 55 centimeter mark, or let's call this zero. They both start out at zero centimeters, and I tell you, uh, they repel each other, and one second later, I find this at some distance x naught. And if I ask, OK, where is the other mass? So this is a question, if you wanted to, you can answer it using conservation of momentum. Right? You can look at this initial repulsion as a kind of reverse collision that's uh, uh, going to you know, send this off in a way that conserves momentum then uh, they will have some ratio of velocities. So based on the ratio of velocities, you can figure out, all right, what do their distances look like as a ratio? Yeah? But here's another way to um, answer the same question, but in a more quicker way. And this is why this property of center of mass is useful in solving some problems. So instead of going through that analysis using conservation of momentum, what you can also say is, well, so this is the position of uh, center of uh, mass. And as these two blocks move, the center of mass will not move if uh, the initial velocity of center of mass was zero. So if I find one of them over here, then I can figure out where the other mass is by figuring out, all right, uh, where would this need to be, given that this is here, so the center of mass remains here? Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, I think I give you some homework questions where you can use this. So let me, um, yeah, so let me leave uh, the center of mass um, idea there. It's uh, one of the things that are good to know about. Um, it's, it's one of the important ideas that we'll actually come back to later. Uh, you'll see center of mass uh, when we start talking about uh, rotation. So you'll see it again, but it's uh, for now, this is how you calculate center of mass. And this is one of the special properties of center of mass that comes from you know, conservation of momentum or equivalently 
from Newton's third law. 